Yo, yo, welcome back to another episode of Island Spot Sports. And before we get to our guest today, we have a big shout out for, for Living Sisu. Living Sisu is a platform and app that wants to give you all the tools to have success in your sport. Their main objective is to activate your lifestyle. So for active, it's for active people. Enjoy discounts at, at companies like BioSteel, 30% off, Body Logics, The Goalie Guild, all his books are discounted. Roan, Lululemon for men. 20% off online stretching programs with eccentrics, one full month free. They got super silent massage guns, 20% off those. And it's a great quality. It's way less expensive than a Theragun. And it's a great, it's great quality. So there's so many more discounts that you guys will need to just become a member to see. So they want to provide you with anything you need for success. So come join the community. I'm a part of it. A bunch of other athletes are a part of it, so it's free to join. It takes 20 seconds to have to get exclusive offers to your sport, and it's definitely worth worth it. So, do do us a huge favor and go sign up for Living Sisu's membership. It's free, 20 takes 20 seconds, so go do it, and we'll see you there. Living Sisu is a great company. We uh we know one of the co-founders, Zach Fricali. He's a great guy. He uh. He's the co-founder. He does a lot of live streams on Instagram at uh, at Living Sisu, and with a bunch of elite athletes. And you learn a lot from like the athletes' determination, the resiliency, everything to what me made them become successful. So it's been a great experience so far. So go on. I'm gonna leave uh, the link in the description. So uh, go sign up. Yo, welcome back to another episode of On Spot Sports. I'm Jack, and today's episode, we are joined by a very special guest, former professional hockey goaltender Ryan Malinowski. Ryan played four seasons of professional hockey overseas in Poland, Denmark, and the ben, the Belgium Netherlands League over in Belgium and, and in the Netherlands. So Ryan played his junior hockey days in the GOJHL before playing four years of NCAA Division three hockey at Buffalo State College before turning pro. So this is gonna be a really fun episode, Ryan. So welcome, welcome to the show, Ryan Malinowski. Thanks, Jack. It's uh, it's good to be with you. Looking forward to uh, probably uh, diverse ranging topics of uh, conversation. So no, looking uh, happy to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you again for being able to come on. I know we've planned this for a while now, but it's good uh, that we both finally got some time to to connect and get this thing going. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but to start things off, like how how have you been? Like you have you have a new kid that's just turned one and actually has happens to have the same name as me. So like that's yep. pretty cool. But uh how's everything with that? And like how's every, how's life going for you right now post hockey? Yeah, pretty good. It's obviously like everyone, like um I retired just for contacts. I'm sure we'll loop back to this, but um I retired the week COVID kind of was starting. Um we got eliminated for playoffs and I think the next day or two, I think the U.S. was announcing that they were going to be closing the border. Um, so I you know, was kind of in a rush back. Usually after a season, you kind of can have a week or two over in Europe to yeah. settle down and then be like, OK, I'll fly home now for the end of the season. But it was more of a like, hey, rush to get your flight and get back. And I was kind of under the impression of, hey, things are bad in Europe. I can't wait to you know, get back to the U.S. and stuff will be better. And um, obviously, you know, two weeks turned into two years, but I think really the, I just have a lot of respect, like with having a, a one-year-old now, I have so much respect for guys that are still playing that have kids. Cause it's like, it, it's like hockey in itself is such a busy job, both physically and yeah. mostly mentally. Um, so obviously like having a kid, that's just like an, an added thing, but um, yeah, you no, know, looking forward to uh, talking on different stuff, but um, you know, I'm doing well. Um, I think a big thing for a lot of hockey players, which maybe I'll touch on a little bit is um, transitioning into um, life after hockey. I feel like players, whether you stop playing hockey after juniors, whether you maybe you stop playing at after a younger age or after NCAA or pro, we tie our identity so much to being an athlete. And whether that's just fictitious in our head or whether it's how other people perceive us, when you go places, you recognize when other people are athletes, hockey players, you can kind of be like, oh, yeah, even if you don't necessarily, sometimes you're not always right, but you're like, Hey, I, they kind of carry themselves as a hockey player. So when you stop playing and you no longer have that feeling of, you know, always people associating with you as an athlete, it's kind of a weird transition. And you kind of have to like recreate like a sense of self, which I think is, um, you know, we can probably touch on a number of players that are doing a good job of 
while they're playing, transitioning into the business aspect. But I think it's something that's not talked on a lot um, of, you know, the transition from, you know, pros, whether you're talking minor leagues in Europe or even over in North America, pro league or pro careers only last a handful of years. And, um, you know, life is long and uh, transitioning over to the, the real world and business is, um, it's not always an easy transition. And I think it's important for people to talk about it because, you know, sometimes it is, does feel depressing and other stuff. So I think that's uh, important to touch on, but, you know, good opening question. Yeah. But like, while, while the topic is hot, like, let's just dive into that yeah. right now. Since, uh, since we're already on it. So like, what was like your story, like behind, like creating, like going like the tech side, you're, you're in the tech side of things. Like what was like the process like to do that? And like, cause like, you did, you did start something when you were in the middle of playing, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that the big thing is um, for, you know, whether we're talking pl players for, um, you know, guys that start stuff, you know, on the business side while they're playing, or maybe they decide to, you know, go into a business endeavor either for themselves or like uh, paired with someone after they play. I think one of the really big things for all athletes, whether we're talking hockey players or just athletes in general is most athletes possess a lot of the attributes that can carry over well into uh, the business world, such as, you know, competitive nature, consistently working hard for many years, um, you know, persevering, being able, okay with objection, okay with failure. So when it comes to the business side, a lot of those same exact skills of hard work over a long period of time, those transition well into the business world. And one thing I found um, was helpful is I think that also players, whether you play in the minor leagues over in North America, or if you play over in Europe, whether it's for one year or a handful of years, or you've talked to some guys that are, you know, journeymen, they played for a really long time. You have an interesting story. And when people are either hiring for positions like executive positions at companies, or if you want to start your own venture, people like interesting stories. So if you have a compelling story of maybe on paper, when you stop playing hockey, you're 25, 30, 35, you don't necessarily meet all the checks and balances of having, you know, five or eight years of corporate experience, but you have a life experience that nobody else has. So that can help you stand out in that environment. So for one example, um, one company I do consulting for a company that's based in Switzerland. And I think one of the criteria, along with having the skill set to do, you know, some of the work that I need to do, I think they just found my um, skill set, uh, you know, interesting of, hey, he's lived over in Europe for a number of years. He's outgoing, can handle a lot, a lot of this stuff. Um, and I'm just giving you one example, but I think that no matter who we're talking, whether we're talking about a player that stops playing junior A at 19 or a pro that stops playing at 28, you carry and possess a lot of those skills that can transfer into the business world. And from going through, you know, hockey experiences, a lot of times you'll realize business environments are pretty easy. So like we're, we're used to being in locker rooms where like, you know, guys will butt heads during season. Sometimes a coach will be yelling at you, but maybe they're doing it for the betterment of you. Yeah. And like in business environments, sometimes people like cave and they're like, ah, I'm getting like, I don't want to use the word like people are soft, but sometimes like with, with hockey, you get kind of hardened in a positive way of understanding like, Hey, this is the way it is. Like sometimes everything's not going to be perfect. And sometimes you have a bad loss and you got to, you know, try again tomorrow, but in the business world, maybe that's hearing four no's and people turning you down and then hearing a yes. But I think that the, the skills that it takes to succeed in sports and business, they're very similar. So that's kind of how I would answer that question. Yeah, I love that. And like, you just get like that connectedness with other people too, especially like you're uh, with your, one of the consulting people you're with dealing with in Switzerland, like you're, you played overseas, you lived overseas, so like, you know, like, obviously you don't, obviously you probably don't know how like Switzerland lives, but like, you know, like the European style and everything. And yeah. then just going into like, going into like adversity, like you're facing, facing obstacles in the business department. Like, you know, since hockey's had, hockey has many different obstacles and adversity you have to face that like you'll just, you'll be up for the task and try and just overcome it. And like, just like, just like goaltending, like, and like any athlete, athlete, like you're going to fail how many times and then you're just going to have to keep pushing yourself and uh, persevering like you said and just get to like the the bottom of it and just work your way out of the out of the hole that you dig and come up on top yeah absolutely and I'm sure I'll I'll loop back to some of those kind of points I iterate on when we go back to like earlier hockey days but we can you know take it wherever you want to go
Yeah, but uh, before we get into uh, like your career so far or your career, like what, who do you think are some of like the most inspiring like athletes that are that are like put per, per, or pursuing a business right now while they're playing or maybe even post career as well? Yeah, um, I'll just give you a few kind of examples. I'll give you two or three um, actually ones that were um, previous guests on your show because I think they're doing cool stuff. Yeah. Um, I can name like, you know, there's obviously athletes that are doing, you know, big things in, you know, the business world and tech, whether it's like Silicon Valley and other stuff. But two cool examples, I, I think are really cool, um, at least, you know, in the niche hockey community online um, that are, they're actually two players, goalies that are still playing. Um, and I just kind of see them from a distance virtually online that they're doing cool stuff. So the first one would be um, uh, Dylan Kelly. He does, um, you've had him on your, your show on an early, I think you've had him on a number of episodes. Yeah. He's got, you know, DK, the you know mobility guy. And I think, I think it's awesome what he's doing from like a brand side of, you know, he's not only moving up in the ranks from like, he was in a similar situation playing like div three NCAA. He was Adrian, obviously is a great school. Um, I have a couple of friends from one guy from Belgium who I think he was his teammate, um, Kyle Brothers. But uh, what Dylan's doing is cool because he's able to take his skill set. And it reminds me of like a more modern version of what Maria Mountain has done always yeah. with like, you know, goalie training pro and, and just training there. And he's like carving out a niche for himself. And obviously, like the playing aspect, it just adds and amplifies to it. So it's cool to see what he's doing there. Um, I think not only, you know, his mobility training not only has helped him on the business front, but I think all that training also can help you like, you know, just helps you be a better goalie. So that's one example. Uh, one other goalie I think has been doing a really good job for a number of years is JP Lamaru, who is also on your podcast. Yeah. I've just seen what he's done from afar. He's obviously played at a high level um, as a goaltender overseas, but he also has uh, JPL goaltending and it's really cool to see how he balances the two. Um, I can tell based on, I think um, he was on, I think, maybe it was Maria Mountain's podcast and then yours, but he's just a really, you know, very professional in the way he handles, yeah. um, you know, both his on ice, uh, you know, takes his training very seriously. Um, obviously comes from a very, um, you know, strong hockey family, but it's cool to see what he does with the balance of, you know, training and really developing that area up in uh, North Dakota. But those are two examples. There's, there's a number of other people I won't um, go on and on, but those are just two examples um, of people I think are doing a really good job of, while they're playing kind of building up their um their niche brand which is obviously really cool yeah those are both great examples and like they've had a ton of success jp just won the championship over yeah, there the and then, yeah and then uh dk went from the fed to the ahl yeah. in the past couple years. so it's yeah. that's impressive both of them have had a lot of success and it's fun to watch what they do and how they grow yeah. their grow their businesses as well yeah it's cool but I want to transition into your playing career a little bit here. So to start things off, like you got to get to the basics of the basics of everything. Like when did you start playing hockey and like what drew you to the position of goaltending? Yeah, no, um, I grew up in uh, outside of Buffalo, New York, um, obviously Buffalo for, you know, obviously per capita, a lot of the cities in you know, Southern Ontario and, and all across Canada, obviously they produce probably in the whole world, they produce the most amount of NHL players, but yeah. Buffalo still, a hockey hotbed in terms of like everyone I everyone you know growing up like plays with a few guys that you know end up making it to the show or playing over in Europe for a while and so I think you're around a lot of guys that are you know high quality players and um, I, I think I kind of had a, a little different upbringing as far as my my youth hockey I got into it my my best friend next door played and also uh, a couple kids that were a number of years older than me down the street played and they're way I think they're like uh, he was like a number of years older than me. So I didn't really know him, but I realized I used to always drive down the street and I'd be like, who's this kid like playing hockey outside in his driveway? He looks sick. And then I realized when I got a little older, I was like, when I got into hockey more, I'm like, oh, it's Brooks Orpic. And so, uh, but like, it's just hockey world's like small. I never, you know, he was obviously way older. So I didn't, you know, train with him or anything, but um, I kind of, I got into playing hockey. I played as a forward first. I think everyone kind of some guys, some guys will play goalie right away. I think a lot of guys, it just kind of happens by accident. I think I was at the stage where uh, I was on a team with uh, Dominic Hasek was playing for the Sabres. So I played with his son for a year and we were all like, we kind of forced his son to be goalie. Cause we're like, Oh, your dad's like the best goalie in the world. Like, why don't, why don't you be goalie? And like, he was okay at goalie, but um, I think I played forward for a couple years. And then I think, do you know, when you're younger, and they kind of give everyone a game at goalie. They're like, hey, yeah. you play a game and then you see if you're any good. 
And I think I played one game and I think I, I just happened to get a shutout. And then I was like, Oh, this position's cool. Like you kind of can have like, it's, I, I related, like, it's very different, but I relate it very much to like being a quarterback in football. Yeah. You have your, you're very liable for if mistakes are made, it's very obvious. You can also make, be a big difference maker. And I think I played goalie then and never really went back, but my, upbringing in hockey was a little bit different than most people in that some people will, you know, play hockey year round. They'll play, you know, triple A from early young age. I never played triple A from a young age. I, I always was, you know, on the select teams and moved up yeah. to play travel. Um, I always played like a year or two up, but I also was really competitive in snowboarding at a young age. So I was kind of at the point when I got to be in high school where I was honestly looking at a lot of players look to go to prep school for hockey. I was almost looking at prep schools in new England to go for snowboarding. And I was at the stage where I'm like, mm, I, I really, you know, what do I want to do? Do I want to do hockey or snowboarding? And um, was really kind of on the fence as I, I graduated high school. And then um, I honestly was just, wasn't playing. I, I didn't have a, you know, a junior team lined up when I graduated. Um, so I, I started attending classes at Buffalo state and um, I happened to, um, I think it was 2008, and this probably leads into maybe your next question, which is, hey, how'd you, you know, land up at Buff State? So I'll just yeah. jump right into it. I was, it was 2008, and I remember it very vividly. I was, I had not played competitively in, you know, four or five months or something like that. And I remember sitting down in my room, I'm still living at my, my mom's house at the time, and I specifically wrote down on a piece of paper, I'm like, I'm going to play professional hockey over in Europe. And this is like, I hadn't played any juniors, hadn't, I just came out, I played AAA before that. I hadn't played any college and I had this envision to say, hey, I'm going to play over overseas in Europe. So I was like, okay, well, how can I reverse and, you know, work backwards from that? Yeah. So what I started doing was, I don't know how it is where you are, but in, in Buffalo, you have a lot of, we call them in some places, they call it stick and puck in Buffalo. We call it skate and shoots. And so what you have is you have a couple ice times a day. We had a four pad by us, um, Northtown Pepsi Center, it's called. And you have from two to three hours a day, free ice time for goalies. For goalies, it's free because obviously yeah. they want goalies. So I was the, I was an absolute rank rat. I would, I was like, hey, like I'm coming out of a position where I am going to have to grind. So for pretty much for eight, nine, 10 months straight leading through, I would wake up Monday to Friday. I would I wake up at you know 6 30 in the morning. The rink would uh, the skate and shoot would start at like nine and go till 10 30. I would show up at the rink an hour early. I'd get dressed in like the ref room in the middle so I could get 45 minutes to myself. And I would just like constantly do this. So I did this for like months and months. And um, I during the time uh, around then I started goalie coaching a little bit uh, under Bob Janos, um, who's one of the big goalie, goalie coaches in uh, Buffalo. And really based on helping goalie coach with him, I learned that like, obviously like, you know, footwork, everything is really important. So I kind of implemented what we were coaching that into my own training regimen. And so I kind of went from being like, you know, I was an okay goaltender to over like six to eight months. I actually was like much more legitimate and was like, okay, I actually like, I, I think I could have a shot to be a walk on an NCAA team. So I think at the time I I, I can't remember. I had like an eight millimeter camera and I videotaped myself doing like crease work drills. And I think around 07, 08, you know, VHS tapes were still kind of a thing. Yeah. So I was taking classes at uh, Buffalo State, which is in the SUNYAC, which is a strong NCAA Division yeah. three mm -hmm. division. And I remember I went to the coach's office, uh, um, Nick Carrier, who's the coach, and I handed him a VHS tape. And I was just like, really like, kind of like, hey, I like, I think I can make your team. They already had three goalies set uh, on their roster. They had um, you know, three goalies. And I think what happened was when inter semester, the fall semester ended, one of the Canadian goalies wasn't happy as like the backup. So he left and they called for an open tryout. So uh, he, he, I think he, he made like a joke. He's like, uh, I don't even know how to watch your video because it's a VHS, like it's not even a DVD. So I think he called me in, there was like a morning tryout with like me, I don't know, a couple other goalies or something like that. And then I, I think they liked me and they invited me to their afternoon practice for like, it was an NCAA, you know, the, the team practice. And I think the guys wanted to get a feel for like how I was on the ice. And it was like a, quite a big like jump because I hadn't been on the ice for a little bit. And so I, you know, after that practice, you know, the captain came over, he's like, hey, we're gonna, you're gonna be on the team for the rest of the season. 
And I was just like, so all of a sudden from, you know, not playing to walk on uh, NCAA Div 3 was like super cool. So it was just quite like a difference of like me being, you know, uh, just turned 19. And most of the guys on the team are all 21 to 25, um, you know, just much older than me, but they welcomed me with open arms. So I played the rest of the season there. It was only like the tail end of the season. And um, going into the next year, I was like, Hey, I want to, um, you know, play more games. So I talked to my parents was like, Hey, I want to go play up in uh, Canada. So I ended up uh, then, you know, going up to you know Canada and maybe you'll ask this one in the next part, but uh, that's, that was kind of the first year origin story and maybe it leads into the next question. Yeah. And I, I really, I really like your, know, like this upbringing story because like, especially like when you are like doing like the usual, like you get one game, you get one game. Like you, I have had goalies come on the podcast and say they either got a shutout or they got lit up with ten goals, and yeah, they still they still somehow found their way with goalie and like and started enjoying it and like and just the the story just goes from there. Yeah, it's a kind of like addictive too. Like I I can get into that a little bit more with like training stuff, but like I feel like it's just like it's such like a you know once you're drawn to the position, it's hard to um, to to not love it. It's just so unique. Um, uh, in all facets, whether it's designing your gear to other stuff, but yeah. So then, um, after that, it led to, um, playing, playing a year up in juniors in Canada. So, um, yeah, that's, that's the first, that's the origins, I guess, story of, you know, how I got into hockey, but yeah. Is, is there like one, like standout, like memory from like your youth hockey days that you were like, you're like, let's go, like, this is what I'm going to do for the, for the, my rest of the hot, my hockey career and go, go pro overseas. No, it was kind of more, it really, like, it was kind of like, I always, like, was, you know, told, obviously, from a young age, a pretty good goalie, but, like, I was very much a late bloomer, so it was more just, like, hey, I don't know, I might be done playing, like, might just start, go to the college route, and then I think, I don't know, I was just sitting in my room one time in, like, 2008, and I was, like, like, I, I, I know I have what it takes, and I have the work ethic, like, I might not necessarily have, like, you know, all the, you know, God-given talent in terms of like just the natural ability, but I can more than compensate on it with, you know, work ethic and all the other tangibles, like working on, you know, off-ice habits, working on, um, you know, maybe not being the biggest goalie, but having really good lateral movement, other stuff. And I think really just the biggest unlock was just that, you know, that moment in 2018 where I was like, I'm going to train for months and months and, and I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, be the, you know, the greasy person that just works really hard. And I don't care if I get 200 no's, I'm going to get a couple of people to say yes. And that's all that matters. So that that's kind of was the, the main thing. And I think then it kind of just carried on from there. Um, and, and that was just a building block of being like, Oh, cool. Like, and I think as you step up um, at different hockey levels, you naturally it's, it, it's kind of weird. You, you start playing at a different level. And then after a year, if you go back to skate with like friends that stop playing you're like either they've slowed down a lot or I've started to get better and it just yeah. kind of like continues. But um, yeah, that's really the, that's kind of the, the origins uh, before, before junior. Yeah, yeah. So then you talked about like your first year at Buffalo state. And so like, what was like, you did get in that like second half of the season, but like, what was like your mindset? Like you're not, you're not playing any games. Like, are you just working at practice and just working like that work ethic and getting like all the movements down, like getting, that like transition going into that like that transition period in the from from triple a before to yeah to not to yeah to not playing and then obviously jump into that yeah yeah it was more just like hey you know understanding the role is like hey you know go your, your practices are kind of like your your game situation so like making sure that you're you're competing uh in practice obviously you're um you know trying to you know work on good habits um obviously you know throughout college if you're you know in a backup role obviously like you have to kind of be, you know, you have to carry your hat well, you have to know when to be supportive of like, you know, the other goalie, but also like push them in a competitive way. Um, but also like for extra other players. So like, are you willing to be on the ice early? Are you willing to stay late? Are you going to stay in the gym extra? Um, what else can you do to, um, for the betterment of the team? You might not be you know playing, but there's a lot of other uh, aspects of stuff you can do. And I think really the, the main thing that I learned in that first year was really the professionalism. So like, coming from a situation of like, you know, when you're playing, you know, minor hockey, when you're younger, um, there might be some aspects of professionalism if your team, if your coach say comes from yeah. that. But uh, in NCAA, it's like you come into the environment where every day you come in for practice, 
You have your equipment manager hanging up, you know, jerseys properly. Um, before practice, you have a, a nice practice plan laid out in front of your stall. You have to look it over and memorize it, um, kind of not memorize it, but kind of have like an understanding yeah. of what it's about. So it's very professional and um, it's, it's not obviously professional because it's collegiate hockey, but it's expected that you, um, you, act, you act as a professional, which I think is, um, that just helps you in life. But that was the, really the main shift. Yeah, and, like, youth hockey is, like, very loose and, like, just go out there, have fun. Like, you're still having fun at the college and professional level, yeah. but, like, it's, like, everyone's, like, everyone's built, like, taking on something different, like, that professionalism. Then you go to college and yeah, it's not, like, the professional level, but, like, you start to learn, like, the the basics of, like, how you have to act, like, when you are, when you do want to, if you want to go professionally. And then if you want, and then like you have a job to do and like you're, yeah. it's about winning system, at that point yeah. too. And just systems and accountability. And maybe we can get into this after we, um, in my, my next stint after uh, we talk on juniors for a few minutes, but really the professional aspect of learning systems of, you know, it, you know, in youth hockey, you're not learning about, Hey, on a face-off draw on the defensive end, this is what each specific player does. Um, whereas in college, it's like, you could spend the second half of practice just working on a couple set plays yeah. Um, so it's like, and every, every level does it a little bit differently, but, uh, yeah, it's quite the, uh, you know, when you explain that to other people, they don't always understand that, but yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a huge, uh, huge difference when you go between the two of those, but then you go into juniors and into the, the Goge the following year with the yep. Leamington Flyers, where you got to like really develop and like get games in again. And like, so like what, what did you see from like your development standpoint of just yeah. going from not playing to playing to like practicing that year in college and then yep. getting a ton of games in juniors? Yeah, it was a really good experience. I, um, I was, um, I was still taking classes. I think um, I took a couple classes in that fall leading up before junior started. And then I was like, Hey, I'm going to go play um, this next year up for juniors. And um, it was a situation where like, I knew if I stayed at the college level as a walk-on, I wasn't going to be getting uh, games. So I was like, Hey, I want to be playing. Uh, juniors I'll be a starter and um, I ended up uh, the GM said hey I'll, we'll bring you in it was I think I the season had already been like three weeks underway um, so the GM brought me in and was like hey we're going to give you um, you know two games on this weekend if you uh, perform well and you know we'll see after these two games we'll sign you so the first game I think I played we got like absolutely you know ripped apart we were we were I think we were the second or third lowest team in the league so like I got, I got a lot of shots all year, but yeah. um, it was, uh, I played for a team, Leamington Flyers up in the Goji, as you mentioned, but um, it's the southernmost city in um, Ontario. It's the tomato capital, uh, random fact, but it was a really, really good setup. They have a really uh, professional um, setup for, for juniors up there. And um, I, I went in, I played my second game, played, played well, and I signed there. And I had a really nice billet family, um, uh, the Mathesons, my friend, uh, Shane Matheson, who I later played over in, um, uh, Belgium with I think he, he right now he's ripping up a uh, uh, Oberliga in Germany but I lived with him and his family uh and uh in Leamington that billet year and it was a great setup um I, yeah. I played a lot uh, I think it was the hardest I ever worked for an 8-8-0 save percentage I think I got um you know just a lot of shots each night but like even though we were losing we had a really good group of our team um and uh, my our, our assistant coach on the team, uh, Jordan Naju, he he formerly played Division Three NCAA. So like I could, I related to him in terms of yeah. like understanding the level, and it was just really really good to get more reps in, be able to you know see different styles of play, and I felt more comfortable at that level um, after playing um, and practicing the end of the year at NCAA, just to have you know an understanding on stuff, and I think probably worked out some habits a little bit more and, you know, gained a little bit more maturity on and off the ice and um, hockey in Canada, it's very, um, you know, competitive, whether you're talking major junior or you're just talking, you know, other junior levels. Um, so that was, that was a really solid year and, um, you know, had a great experience there, um, you know, over the border, a few hours. And then that's, then I ended up back down um, back at Buffalo state um, the next year, which is obviously my hometown. So yeah. when I came back to um, Buffalo state, I was in a situation where, when I came back, they, um, you know, um, the starter, um, my goalie partner for my last couple of years there, Kevin Carr, he was already established as the starter when I came back in. Um, so it was more, it, it was pretty set in stone when I came back in that, you know, I was not going to be coming into a starting role by any means. It was, yeah. I was coming in as, um, you know, I was going to be the, you know, number two. And really it was a situation where, um, 
it was, it was good for me in that I was able to, I had the benefit of being able to still play college hockey. My whole family lived in Buffalo. So I, you know, I didn't have to live away from home. It was nice. Yeah. Got to go with my that family. Was, that's nice. So, so that part was cool because a lot of players don't have that in, you know, and NCAA, they live far away from home. So I was in a situation where sure, could have I transferred to another school my, my last few years at Buff State? I, I had the opportunity to potentially do that, but it really didn't align. I already had a ton of credits towards my degree. I liked being, you know, home um, in, in that city. And uh, I had a situation where it was, it was a good setup. And I'll, I'll touch on my senior year in, in probably a few minutes, but throughout my um, sophomore year going into, you know, junior year, uh, I felt like I was, uh, we, had a, we had a good team. I was competing, um, wasn't, you know, getting necessarily the ice time I, I thought I was, but from the coach's perspective, 10 years later, looking back, um, I think that my, uh, you know, our coach made the right decision at the time. My goalie partner yeah. was an all American. He's obviously played, you know, he played really well and, you know, the, the coast for a while plays over in Europe still. Um, so obviously I was just in a spot where I happened to have a stud of a goalie partner college wise. And when I did play, I, I played, played well, but the amount of starts I got throughout NCAA, it was more of like, my experience was I was at the rink day in and day out, ton of training, but games didn't show for it, which obviously, you know, made it a little harder when I, when I yeah. turned pro, cause obviously you're trying to, you're trying to prove to GMs from afar that, Hey, I can legitimately play, but you don't necessarily have the, the games played to back it up. So uh, that's always tricky with, with goaltenders. Uh, so that's kind of, uh, and we can, we can go from wherever you want from here, but that's kind of like the, the lead back into to college yeah. hockey, so to speak. Yeah. So you talk about like maturity and all that through like juniors and then like the first, the like next couple of years of college and like, it's like, was that like one of the biggest takeaways you took away from the, from those years, especially like when you did see a lot of shots in juniors, like you're, you have to keep your emotions in check just, and like, it comes with maturity and all that. And then we're going into like, just practicing, like you just got to carry yourself a different way since you're not getting that ice time. Yeah. And it was, it was tough. Like I, I went through those, those couple of years of like knowing that it's, it's really hard. Like, cause if you're like, I think a lot of goalies will tell you this, but like to be able to be like on and dialed, you really should be playing more games. Yeah. Um, so like me going through that, it's like, yes, you can replicate stuff in practice to an extent, but if you're not getting those games and reps, it's, it's really hard to recreate it. Yeah. And so you're, you're, you have the habits, you have the reaction time, you have the other aspects so I think it's just like, kind of like, it's very internal and in your head of like, you have to tell yourself like, Hey, this is the reason I'm going to continue training. So like throughout that time, it's like, you're training day in and day out, you're training in the summer, uh, you're dedicating so much to the craft and not being able to reap the rewards of like the benefits of winning, um, what is, is obviously challenging. And, yeah. um, that, that led into, um, you know, in my senior year, I, um, was in talks with, uh, you know, an, an agent who obviously I didn't. Uh, I ended up being kind of a scammy guy who was trying to tell me, Hey, you should leave early. And like, I'll find you a pro team over overseas and um, nothing came of it. But I was, um, uh, I ended up, I left, I left my NCAA team uh, at the end of my senior year, just cause I, you know, told the team, the coach, I said, Hey, I'm not like, uh, I'm not happy in this situation. I feel like I should be getting some more um, ice time and yeah. looking back on it. Like, I think I should have left in a, in a different manner. I think, I think if it wasn't for my NCAA coach and a carrier, even giving me a chance to be a walk-on, I don't think I would have ever even continued to play. So I owe so much in um, all of my hockey. I owe specifically, um, you know, solely to him to even give me an opportunity, but I was in a situation where I was frustrated, not playing for a while, but I completely understand his point of view. So it, it worked out, it worked out in the end, but um, you know, it's, it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's funny where, where stuff leads, but I thought the NCAA hockey experience, both on and off the ice, was very um, uh, beneficial. Um, although didn't get as many games as I wanted to play in college, which I think all the goalies deal with, whether it's at the yeah. Division One, NCAA, you know, Div Three level, you know, you forwards, defensemen, a lot of guys play, but with goalies, if you got a hot goalie that's playing for a while, like there's not much reason to change it. So even though I got in, um, I beat a couple, you know, strong teams ranked nationally at the time, but. Uh, it didn't align to, you know, get more starting minutes. So it is what it is, but I still developed a lot as a player. So I, there's nothing to look back on uh, poorly there. So. Yeah, absolutely. So like throughout your college career, you did get in five games, your junior year. It's like, what were those yeah. five games like, especially like in that first college start? Yeah, I think my first college start, I think I played versus uh, St. Thomas, who's uh, I think St. Thomas, did they turn, 
they might have turned Division One this year, but they were. Yeah, I think, I think next year they're turning Division One. Next year, okay, yeah. So they have that transition period, but yeah, um, yeah I think uh, I think I beat them in a in a tournament. We played them in Adrian College, I think, and uh, I think I won won my first start, which was cool, and um, and I think I beat a couple other teams, Hobart, um, a few other you know games, getting some time played, but it, it was a good experience. I, I think I. I finally, when I, you know, won it, I think I realized, you know, I was like, Hey, I, like, I know I can win more at this level. Um, just hadn't had the opportunity to. So yeah. it was, you know, it, it was, uh, you know, felt, felt good to finally, you know, have that. Um, and I remember when I, when I won that at the time, I, it was a, a few months earlier, I was goalie coaching and I took a puck to the, the oh. mouth. So I had two missing teeth for like a while. So I remember like after the game, I think my coach gave, gave me the, you know, the puck for, for winning. And, uh, I think I had like a, a missing tooth. So I looked like, uh, what's his name from dumb and dumber, but, uh, no, it was a good, ex good experience. So, um, yeah, that was, uh, that was kind of the, the first college start, so to speak, um, that it was a good experience. Yeah. So then you go into those, those other like four games that you played, like what do you, what do you take away, especially like from that transition from going to practice and then getting into games and having, having the chance to like actually get that game experience. Yeah. It was, it's pretty like pretty, pretty normal like obviously and it wasn't like a crazy amount of time but like um yeah. when I did get in I felt very comfortable being in net I think if I you, you throw me in you know those those five games NCAA if I would have played 15 20 games in that season I think I would have played just as good we had a really quality group of guys um but uh yeah it, it just was what it was and then um uh, yeah I thought I felt comfortable at that level so um yeah it's just the way the way it panned out yeah, so then you go into your senior year and you uh you didn't get to play any games senior year, but you did get to practice with the uh, Buffalo Sabres during the lockout years. So, like, was like what happened with all that, and like how do you get the opportunity to train with uh, with the Sabres? Yeah, it was actually interesting. Uh, I, I'm not sure, depending on you know the listeners of this, how old you are. Most most people listening will still recall uh, during 2012, um, 2013, there was the NHL lockout for five six months. Yeah. So there was, uh, you know, they're going through collective bargaining, trying to set up. And it was a time where, you know, they, the NHL didn't start until after the new year. And so I had the opportunity through um, Jordan Leopold, who's retired now, but he was the um, with the Sabres at that time. And I got an invite through him. Um, he knew I played um, NCAA hockey in town and, and got invited through him and a, a friend of mine, uh, Brian Kelzinski, who also used to play um, college hockey and just started training with them each week um, during, uh, you know, that last year. And it was kind of a, a cool situation. I'd be like, I'd go to class in the morning and I'd get a ping from them being like, hey, we're, we got a lockout skate at 10 in the morning. Uh, can you skate with us? And like, I was obviously like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be there, like skip class or like rearrange some stuff. And um, it was a cool experience of like just being able to skate with those guys every day, like four days a week and just just the professionalism, like, and this is why I think when it's really hard, sometimes when you talk to guys that don't play hockey and you have to yeah. guys like are ripping on like, Oh, so-and-so is a fourth liner. Like he sucks. Like I can tell you for a fact, there's obviously a difference between your top tier guys in the show and sure your third and fourth liners, but there's a majority of guys that are in the AHL top lines that can easily all interchange with NHL third and fourth lines and even like guys that are like supposedly, you know, fighters, like Cody, yeah. Cody McCormick, McCormick, for example, was a fighter on the Sabres. I'd stand with him at like the blue line. That guy can go like bar down like 10 times. Like everyone's a good player. John Scott, great player. But it was cool to be in the locker room with them um, because, you know, you, you go around the first day and a number of guys are all introducing themselves. And I grew up in Buffalo. So like you grew up watching them. So like guys are like, hey, you know. Uh, what's your name? Like, uh, my name's Jason, you know, Jason Pominville, Thomas Vanek, um, all sorts of um, Mar Marty Baran, all sorts of guys, and, you know, Billy Lano, and, and just a really good group of guys. Steve Ott was there at that time, and uh, so skating with all these guys, it was just, like, real cool experience, and you, you skating with those guys, like, a number of times a week, you really, you know, step up your game, and it was actually really funny. It was during the lockout, so um, I, I don't know if you're familiar, but Marty Baran, he played a little bit longer after that lockout, but he was, yeah. he was a goalie I grew up watching for the Sabres. And I remember it was during the lockout. So not all the guys were training like crazy. And I remember he showed up like one of his first, the first days. And like, we were playing three on three back and forth. And I was like, our team, we were just beating him every time. Like he just wasn't, he was just having an off day in that, like letting in a number of goals and stuff. But then like, as stuff progressed and like, as he got a little bit more dialed for like the season to start, like he started to turn it on more and more. 
And so it was just like cool experience. But like, I, I think the only other part like that's probably worth mentioning on this is I've had a number of players over the years ask me like, hey, like during that time, like who is the best player you skated with? Like who's the best player on the Sabres during that time? And I think of all the guys I've ever skated with, without a doubt, Thomas Vanek was, you know, you have NHL players and then there was like Thomas yeah. Vanek. He was just at such a high level. Uh, his release wasn't like crazy hard, but it was super hard to read. And like just a natural player, um, great size, but um, it was just interesting. You'd be on the ice, like with like guys doing drills and like he stood out even amongst them. But um, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was cool to do that. And then that kind of transitioned into uh, my next year over in, in Poland of graduating um, to go over to Poland. But yeah, that kind of wrapped up the, the college aspect. Yeah. And like, it, it's crazy when you like actually get in like those like highly competitive games and practices and like, you're just doing mini games with the boys and like, yeah, like, especially like when you got guys like that could change the angle within like a half a second, like oh, I think there the great release and you, you can barely read it. And, and after a while you start picking it up, but it's just like, everyone's is a little, a little different. And it's like at the highest level, like I, I always say, like you could, you could go to your random pickup hockey league. Anyone can shoot a puck 80 or 90 miles per hour, like yeah. in your beer league. But does that mean that you put them in a game situation and they're on the move with the defender? Are they going to be able to recreate any of that? No. So it's just like the intricacies and the level of hockey IQ at that level is just, just filthy. Yeah. And like I skate with some like AHL, ECHL guys and like they can still shoot the puck like nothing. And it's just like, they'll like, there's a few guys that like, I'm like, wow, with their release. Cause like, they'll just switch it. They're tall and they have like big, big sticks, long sticks. Yeah, they so like pull it real they'll, far. they'll pull it like, pull it either out super far or like pull it in within like a second. Like by yeah. that point, like it's hard to stop that. Yeah. And a lot of people that don't play and, and most of your listeners obviously are all like a lot of hockey focused, but a lot of people don't yeah. understand like the science and angles of goaltending. If you put a goaltender in net, if you're head on from a puck, you have to always look at things from the pucks angle coming towards you. And when it comes to, let's say the example you have of like a guy pulling and dragging it, if you're able to pull it a few feet one way or pull it the other way before your release, you're opening up so many more holes and creating so much more room. And I think a lot of people watching don't necessarily understand um, the science of it, but yeah, no, it's uh, interesting. Uh, uh, it's always, it's always cool to see, especially when you see it done well. Yeah, absolutely. But then the following year you go into your first professional season overseas in Poland. So like, what was the process like to get to, yep. to get to Poland and then like, your experience like going actually traveling from North America to Poland? Yeah, no, um, well, I, I came out of, um, I think one of the, you know, and reasons why I had that opportunity was during when I was skating with the Sabres for a while, I was able to get good quality reps, good ice time. Um, one of my former teammates who I played with in uh, college, uh, Kevin Kozlowski, um, I think he played, he played a year over in Poland and then played a little, I think he won a championship in the, uh, the SP yeah. Um, and he, um, so he initially went over through an agent, uh, named Rafalo Amasta, who's a real good guy. And so he initially introduced me to going over there. So he kind of arranged everything. And, um, man, when I shoot, showed up in Europe, my first time, it was like an absolute culture shock. So this is kind of where like story time comes in, so to speak. And so, uh, I fly over, um, at the beginning European season starts four to six years weeks earlier than North America. Yeah. Um, so in, in Poland, training camp starts early. So you're flying over at the end of July. I know guys in the KHL fly over even earlier, but so you're over there really early and uh, I show up at the airport. I have two to three guys that look like they were, you know, from a, a movie scene from the mob. I mean, they could have been, but they were really wonderful with me. They had a sign with my name. They drew a really fancy Mercedes Benz. Uh, they picked me up. They carried my gear. Uh, they took me uh, for a kebab my first day and uh, would drive me around and uh, we didn't really phone, think of mobile phones today in 2022, obviously like, you know, Google translates perfect, but this was, you know, 2013, 14 time mobile phones, you could use Google translate, but sometimes it would mess up. So yeah. he couldn't speak English. Uh, I couldn't speak, I could speak a little bit of Polish. And so we talked back and forth, you know, you could verbally communicate and smile, but sometimes we didn't know what to say to each other. Yeah. So he would drive us around, he'd take us to the rink. And um, I was there with a, a couple other imports and we just lived at the hotel, ate sushi at the sushi restaurant every night. And um, so I trained for two weeks there. And then I headed to a team called uh, GKS 
uh, G GKS Yashjimbia, and so that's near the Czech border. And I was in a situation where I was planning to sign with the team there. And what happened was they have uh, a player hotel right next to the, the rink. So I'm there skating for a number of days, have a good setup, um, looking to sign there, have an exhibition game. And what happens is um, I'm there, I'm reading, uh, have you ever read the, the Game by Ken Dryden? It's a good book. Yeah. I'm sitting there uh, next to my window. I'm on the first floor reading at night, kind of have my passport, some money out on the nightstand next to me. And it's a lot, 11 at night, it's real dark on the weekend. And I hear a bang on the window. I'm like, That's weird. I'm like, okay, I'm in like a foreign country. Like, this isn't good. So I peek around uh, the side window and then I hear another bang and a bunch of yelling. And I'm thinking, I'm like, okay, maybe they're fooling around, they'll walk away. And so then I look and it's like two guys with a crowbar trying to break into the room. And so I'm like, holy crap. So I try calling, uh, you know, the Polish version of 911. And obviously they don't speak a lick of English. So I'm trying to, I'm like, uh, you know, help, you know, you need your help. Like, you know, this is a serious matter. Like, you know, it looks like a couple idiots are trying to break in or something like this isn't cool. So then I get the president, the team president on the phone. And I'm thinking, I'm like, oh, he's going to take this really seriously. He's going to, you know, come over. He's going to apologize and be like, you know, all is well. And I'm like rattled at this point, not like just yeah. rat more kind of a mix of rattled and like super mad about the situation. Cause I'm like, Hey, he's going to like put me up in a nice hotel, like apologize, you know, all is going to be well and clear. And he like comes and he's like, Oh, all is fine. You're fine. You can stay here for the night. And I'm like, stay here for the night. Like <laughs> it would just happen. I'm like, I'm not staying here. So I, I got like a, a taxi, went back up to uh, Katowice, which is the city I ended up playing in. Went back up there. They already had their goalie signed. So I ended up, I, I flew home. Um, they had their goalie signed for the year. And as Christmas rolled around, they were having, uh, one of their goalies got traded and they weren't happy with the, um, another goalie got injured. They weren't happy with their performance. So they flew me over after Christmas and uh, I signed for, I was planning to sign for the rest of the season. And uh, I flew back over and, you know, had, they had a really weak team, but I was like, Hey, I need to get some games played in. So uh, I flew back over. I, I only played in a handful of games, um, uh, four or five games there. Um, and when I was there, it was like situation 50, 60 shots a night. Um, I got my, I actually got my first win in a city called uh, um, it's Auschwitz where, you know, obviously the well-known unfortunate situation with concentration yeah. camps, but the team's called Unia Asvencia. Um, and there um, I, I got my first uh, pro win there. And um uh, after that, you know, the team was in a situation where I think my last two games in Poland, we had 14 guys rostered. I think a number, a handful of guys refused to play uh, because they weren't getting, you know, the previous month's paychecks. So I was like, I can't, I can't play. Like I just got 65 shots last night. I'm like, I can't, I, I can't stay here and not be making money. I'm like, you know, I, my, you know, my, my bank account's going in the red. I'm like, I'd love to keep playing. I like, I had a, I was talking to a team there for like signing the next year. Um, but I was in a situation where like, Hey, financially, like I, I can't. So, yeah. um, I, I flew back uh, home. I was pretty annoyed about the situation. Cause I'm like, Hey, like if they would have just paid, you know, guys have, have followed through on like the rest of paychecks for the year. Um, I think it would have been a better situation. So, um, playing over there was a cool experience. Um, the, the people of Poland are really wonderful. Um, it's, it's definitely, definitely has an Eastern Bloc, Eastern European vibe. Um, but I, I have a lot of good things to say about it. Um, I, I know the management at the time um i didn't have a lot of great things to say about because they had a, some financial issues but um in terms of um the people of poland and katowice itself nothing but wonderful team uh things to say about my teammates and, and everything and uh the agent that helped me get over there rafael masta he's a great guy and um, he's helped a number of players that are on the national team over there get over there so um yeah that was that was the main thing and then lastly i think uh, well katowice now they they just won the polish championship and uh, they're having success now. So it's, it's nice to see um, over the last five to 10 years, they've really turned around their um, organization. So that was, that was my, my stint in, uh, in Poland. And I guess we'll, we'll continue from there. Yeah. So like, what was that getting that first like professional win out of the way and like the, uh, like emotions, like everything you went through, like from juniors to college yeah. and then just getting into that, getting into that, the pro game and getting a yeah. W. It was cool, like playing over in uh, Poland, like, I don't know if, uh, I'm sure some of your listeners have played in certain European rinks where yeah. the atmosphere is much more like a soccer match than it is like a hockey match. And, you know, obviously there's great hockey arenas all over North America, yeah. but if you get into a place where they have passionate football or proper football fans, a lot of them attend hockey games as well. 
and they will cheer literally a whole game. So like, I remember like my first game, a couple of my first games in Katowice, it's like, you kind of like, you get kind of like little chills up your back a little because like they're doing chants, they got the drums out the whole game. Um, it's really cool environment. And uh, the, the first one was cool. One of the interesting things is um, in Eastern Europe, our coach was spoke, you know, it's a little easier for goalies than it is for forwards and D because yeah. in practice, you, you don't, you can look at the board. You can generally see what the drop is like, Hey, are we doing three on two uh, breakout regroup, whatever the drill is you stand in net and you see the first round of the drill. And then you're like, okay, I got this. Whereas like players, you kind of have to look at the same thing, but it was funny. Like you're usually leading up to games, like obviously leading up to games, you have like a dialed routine of how you do stuff, yeah. mm-hmm. but it's weird. Like to be sitting in a locker room um, when a coach is speaking a foreign language and they're talking about the preparation for the game, specific things. But since you don't understand all of the language, you're kind of like in your own head, just like talking to yourself. So like, I remember like that first, the, uh, the first win on the road in uh, Ashvansom, it was kind of like a situation where it's like, I'm okay. I'm like, I'm back in it. Like kind of, okay. Like the coach is talking in like Polish. I'm like, I'm still, I grasp little bits of it, but then it's like on the ice, all my teammates still like, they'll talk to me in like English a little bit. The fans obviously are all like yelling and stuff. And like, um, but it's still like when you win, you win. Like the languages yeah. aside, it's like winning's winning. It's still like cool. Like um, you know, it's a you know, dabe dabe is like go 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 in, in Polish. But yeah, no, it's a, it a cool experience, and I I, I liked uh, the Polish league. It was just you no, know, I would have loved to go back there later, but it worked out better to play elsewhere. So yeah, that was kind of the the, the first taste of it, so to speak. Yeah, that that's awesome because a win, a win's a win, no matter no matter whose book it is, a win's gonna be a win. And then, yeah. like you had a good experience overall in Poland with like the people. Besides, like almost getting like that robbed financial. or whatever. Yeah, but, uh, other than the that, financial were great. situation, but everything yeah, else like, seemed seemed great. Yeah, it was cool. Like you, you kind of take the the tram everywhere, and like people, you know, offer to you know, hey, would you like us to you know have have you over for dinner? We'll teach you Polish, and like people were like so nice. Like I even. I even have people to this day will message me from there and like, I'll keep in touch with them. And I speak a little Polish so I can talk to yeah. them, but um, yeah, no good, good people and good things to say about the country. Yeah. That's awesome. So then in 2014, 2015, 2015, 2016, you didn't play. So yeah. like, what do you, what do you do during that time and just yeah. like re refuel and recharge for going back, going to Denmark <clears throat> the year, the year after. Yeah. I was in a situation where, as I said, like kind of like bank accounts in the red. So yeah. obviously like, you know, I have to come back and it wasn't necessarily in the red, but it was more a situation of like, Hey, like, you know, I'm leaving so much money on the table of you know, yeah. not. So I, I moved back to uh, the States and I actually signed to play with um, the following season for Polonia Bitum, which is another team in the Polish league. So I flew back over there for a number of weeks and it was a situation that came down to uh, myself and a goalie from the KHL came over and it came down to a situation that we both played a couple of exhibition games. I played good in one, he played good in one. Um, and it just frankly came mostly down to money. <laughs> he wanted, he was willing to play for about half of what I was. And I was in a situation where uh, it was like, hey, it made more sense for me to fly back home to the States. And, yeah. you know, I would have loved to play there. It would have been cool to stay in the league, but, uh, you know, it didn't work out financially. So I was like, hey, you know, chalk it up. And, I was at that point, maybe thinking, I was like, Hey, maybe I'll just call it a, you know, day be done playing. Um, so I was back, back home. I, I lived out in uh, Tucson, Arizona, and I worked at a, a tech company um, under the CEO. I helped run their marketing team, um, did sales, uh, went to different conferences, trade shows, and really just worked. I worked for an Inc 5000. So I did uh, learned a lot in the tech and, you know, startup scene there. And during that time, even though, you know, I was in the office every day doing good on, you know, business side and stuff and gaining more experience there. I always constantly that, that next full year I had, you know, from thinking I was going to be over in Poland playing another year when I came back, you know, I'm, you know, sitting in the office, like just having the itch to like, man, I, I still have stuff left in the tank. And it was like, kind of like a fight of like, Hey, I know I do, but like, okay, I need to build up stuff a little bit more over here yeah. to be able to play again, like both financially and just like, Hey, to find a good situation. So, you know, work there for a year and the next year, um, was like, Hey, I, I actually want to, I want to still play. So I, I put together a plan of, uh, down in Tucson, Arizona. Now they have an AHL team, but at the time they didn't, uh, they didn't have one like, you know, a number of years ago. Yeah. So the closest ice rink to me was an hour and 40 minutes North in uh, Phoenix. And so what I did was I would start working at eight thirty nine in the morning 
and I got in touch with a few guys that they had ice time at from six to seven thirty up in Phoenix. So I had a regimen for a number of months where I would wake up at three forty-five, and I would drive an hour and forty minutes up to Phoenix, and I would be on the ice by five forty-five. I would skate for an hour or a half an hour by myself. I had a group of guys that um, would come out and shoot on me. One guy, I think currently Brandon Fade, he played, I think, in the SPN Coast for a little. I think he's in Elsvenskan this year. He would come out and shoot on me. A couple other guys that play in Europe now would come out and shoot. And then I'd be off the ice by 7.30, take a quick shower, hop on I-10 on the throughway, uh, through driving through the desert, back in the office by 9. And then I slowly was just like, okay, I can, if I train for a number of months, I can get back in into good playing shape and play. So I did that. And then coming out of that, I, um, I, I got in contact with um, uh, a team in Denmark and um, they, they, the, the GM there, Soren Clausen, he's a good, a good guy. Um, I still chat with him a little bit these days, um, but he, um, they were creating a, a new inaugural team there for, you know, the first season. And they said, Hey, like, he's like, Hey, I know you haven't played in, you know, a year and a half, but you just sent me over your, your game film. And he's like, I know you can play. Uh, so he brought me over and um, I, I played a season there and I was like, you know what, I kind of want to, I was thinking of hey, going to a little higher tier, um, but yeah. I hadn't played and there. And he told me, he said, I'm going to bring you in. It's going to be a great situation. You're going to, um, you know, be a veteran guy in the locker room. Um, you'll, uh, you'll start pretty much every game um, as long as you're playing well. Yeah. Um, and, and Denmark is a really, really cool country. It's honestly it's very different than Poland. And I can get into that in a minute or two, but um, they call it, uh, you know, this, one of the safest countries in the world, which is, it definitely is. You, you, people, nobody locks their houses. Uh, people, you know, leave their dogs on a leash outside of grocery stores. And it's just, uh, everyone rides bicycles. I don't know if you, yeah. if you Google Copenhagen, like people ride bikes everywhere. And um, yeah, no, so I can, I can dive into like the hockey style of Denmark, but that was kind of my transition of, that time off back into uh, playing in, in Denmark, which uh, it, I thought it was a great experience. Yeah. So then you get that opportunity, like you, like you said, like the, with the coach and everything and you play in 24 games. So like, what was it like playing in Denmark playing on for like the hockey, hockey side of things? And like, what were some of the things you learned, especially after taking that year and a half off yeah. and then coming back and going into a, a better league in Denmark and just coming in and just showing what you got? Yeah, it was a good situation in Denmark. The way, I don't know how it works these days, but the, the way they have it with their leagues there is you can actually, um, and, and before I went over there, I had a, a team in Metal League on or two reach out, but it ended up being a better financial situation to sign yeah. in uh, Denmark too. Um, so it was a situation where um, when I came in there, you can actually, guys can be rostered on both rosters. You can be on Metal League on, and you can also play games on, um, um, Denmark too, as well. And it was, it was a really, you know, it's a good, good feeder league. Um, the, the talent is pretty, pretty good. Um, it's definitely pretty noticeable. Um, sometimes when you go to like one team and you realize that, you know, your top first and second line are obviously a bit stronger than like your lower lines, but yeah. Denmark's a really big, um, you know, speed game there. Uh, it's not really that physical, like fighting's pretty non-existent. I mean, that's a lot of Europe, but um, it, it was a, a good level of hockey. I was, I felt super comfortable um, playing there. We had a, you know, a decent team. We, um, we lost the first round of playoffs, but like I had a, I had a good year. I had a number of uh, uh, imports over there with me that, you know, we, we had a good experience on and off the ice. And um, yeah, it was, it was a good setup. People of Denmark are really nice and uh, treat you well. I think people in Denmark speak better English than most, uh, most North Americans. So uh, it's, in, again, it's very, very safe place. And, uh, I, I had a good experience in Denmark, getting more games and reps in. Yeah. Um, after a few games, I was like, okay, I can handle this really well. I'm comfortable again. Um, and then obviously just like doing doing the habits on and off the ice. Um, and, and that's one thing I think throughout not playing for a while, I think for this is for, maybe I can touch on this a little bit later as you ask me a question on like what I recommend for younger goalies, but it'll all tie back to, you know, consistency of doing, doing all the, the mundane things that not aren't necessarily fun or you know glamorous it's yeah. you know training footwork off ice habits things of that nature which i can get to later but yeah denmark was a was a good experience and uh, off the off the ice um on the ice i think if any player is listening to this and is considering potentially playing in scandinavia 
I highly recommend it. It's a great living experience off the ice, good, good quality of life. And, um, you know, you'll learn a thing or two. Danish is way too hard to learn because everyone just wants to speak English with you because they like, they watch English movies. Yeah. Uh, but, but it, it was cool there though. So it's better, a better transition for you since they're, they're speaking English and you can actually communicate with them a little better than you were the year before. Yeah. In, in Poland and even Poland, like yeah. most people can speak English, but like at one time in Poland, I was at the grocery store and I'm like, I know that kurzak means chicken. So you like, I was like, oh, I know the old lady doesn't speak English, but I'm going to point at the chicken. And then I get up to the counter and there's no chicken. And I'm like, uh, I'm like, Sheprasham, like that means sorry in Polish. I'm like, Sheprasham, I, I like, I, uh, uh, Nirozumi. I'm like, I don't know. So I'd like okay. say that. And like, they look at you like you're just, you're, you're an alien. But in Denmark, if you try to speak English, they're like, they'll jump to English with you. Like, and then they'll have better dialect than you. And you're like, okay, you guys are smart. So, uh, but yeah, no, that- both, both experiences are cool. It's just very, it's polar opposites. Yeah, that, that's awesome. So then you go into, you don't play in 2017, 2018, but you do go back to, you go to the Bene Liga for, yep. in, in Belgium and the Netherlands in 2018, 2018 through the 2020 season. So like, what was your time in the Bene Liga like and just being able to be in one, in one city for two years? Yeah, it was a good setup, I think. Um, when I initially uh, decided to sign back there, I was like my last, um, you know, I knew I was like, Hey, I'm going to play two more years after that, you know, um, yeah. in, in 2020, I'm like, Hey, I knew I was going to retire. Um, but it was a situation where I was initially planning prior to even going to the Benelli, league. I had already um, planned to sign with uh, Prisma Riga, which is in the top Latvian league. And yeah. so I um, had talked to a really, really great guy. Uh, his name's Eric Malunz. And he uh, has been a part of uh, Prisma Riga, which is in Riga, Latvia. I'm running the team there. So I flew over there in August and uh, they have a cool setup. Um, the Latvian league isn't as well known because it's um, uh, just based on it's not real. There's not a crazy amount of teams. So a lot of teams are locally based around Riga. Um, and I arrived there and it was a really cool, um, cool group of guys. Very Eastern Bloc in the sense of I think we had four guys on our roster with, you know, KHL experience. So it was very... Wow very strong, strong pace. Um, a number of guys that have played all over the place. Like we had a couple of guys that played in NL, um, NLB, um, the KHL guys I mentioned. And it was yeah. a situation where, um, I was, I was there, you know, I was living at the hotel and it was a, a, another, another Eastern European situation where classic Eastern Europe, you walk into the hotel, one side of the, the first floor is, a very dark and dreary bar that looks like it's straight out in 1955 post-World War II. On the other side of the hotel entrance, there's like the counter and there's a very smoke-filled pool hall. Cool. And then on the back side, there's a very dark breakfast room where you have fish for breakfast. And then the hotel all kind of has that like musky smell. The hotel was yeah. nice, but it's very like, you know, you're in Eastern Europe. And yeah. so um, I had a cool situation there. I was there for a number of weeks and uh, came to a, an agree. I was going to agree to sign there. Um, and during uh, that last week before I signed, I actually um, I, I got an outreach from. I was talking to Gil Palink, who is was my head coach in uh, Benelli for two years, and I had been talking to him about potentially playing elsewhere um, because he he just knows a lot of people in the hockey world. And he reached out to me and said, "Hey, like we're actually um, we're in a spot right now where they they're like, hey, we have one import signed." Uh, they had uh, one import sign. Ed, his name's Jordy Woodrick. Um, he was uh, drafted by Los Angeles and had played for a while. And he was signed as one of their imports. And they said, hey, we, we want to bring over uh, an import goalie to have a stronger team. And so I talked to him and I said, hey, like right now I'm planning on signing in Latvia. I said, uh, what's the best way to, you know, to work this out so it could be a potential good fit? And he said, hey, he's like, I completely respect that. He's like, I, we can fly you in for a weekend. And he said, if you play an exhibition game um, and, and the, the president likes what he sees, uh, we'll sign you on that spot that night. And then you can uh, inform the team in Latvia that you're going to stay here. So it just happened to work out that I had a couple day break um, where I, I flew there. Um, I, I let the team in Latvia know um, based on that, hey, it was a better financial situation to sign in, in Belgium. And so when I got to Belgium, played the first game, uh, I think, I don't know if we won or lost two, three or four, three, whatever it was, but I had a solid game and uh, they, they signed me that night. And uh, it was a really, it was a cool, cool change of pace. Um, when I got there, they gave me, you know, a, a car. I had a 
you know, gas car for, card for filling it up. And they set me up in a nice apartment in town. And um, uh, it was, it was a cool experience. The, um, yeah. I, and, and one of the, the drawing factors that brought me to Belgium was my uh, billet family from uh, Leamington back in junior, uh, Shane Matheson. He was uh, one of the, you know, star players for uh, Liège Bulldogs in the same league. And so before I flew there, I, I messaged Shane and was like, Hey, Shane, like uh, I'm talking to the team in Leuven. Like, what do you think? Should I, it, is, is, how's the league? And like, there's a number of teams in the Netherlands that get draw real good sold out crowds do, yeah. do really well. And it's, you know, the, the level of imports in Benelux league is really quality. Obviously like the teams don't all have crazy depth, but imports there, you can only have two to three imports. So like the level of imports generally U sports NCAA, or maybe some guys with major, major junior. And I messaged him and I was like, Hey, should I sign there? And I remember he responded back with, he goes, your home barn is really old, but your DJ is good and you'll like the league. <laughs> And so, and he said that the town was really cool. So uh, that was like, I'm friend, I'm good friends with him. And so I was like, okay, like I trust his judgment. I kind of want to play against him. And so I was like, okay, I'll sign here. So then as soon as I, I got to Belgium, I was welcome. My coach picked me up at the airport and had a really strong, good feel from him right away. Uh, you know, he's, I, I have so many good things to say about uh, Gil, who was the head coach there. Um, he took off this past year with COVID starting to, um, you know, do family stuff and focus more on that. He might get back into coaching, but um, he was an awesome coach to play with. And he was, he kind of took the, uh, the role of, Hey, you know, we see you and the other import coming in as you know, guys with experience. And he would really talk to you on stuff. Like when it came to like making decisions on like, Hey, who, who should be slotted in here on the second power play. It was very collaborative in that, in that way. And uh, you know, just had a really good experience in Belgium. Uh, my, my import, um, Adam Legozo, who he's playing right now with Den Haag this past year, I played two seasons with him. He ended up coming in to be the other import with me and had two really good years with him. And um, the, the team there was, was tight and had a lot of local guys. Um, they're definitely like the underdog team of Belgium and yeah. uh, had a good experience there. I think um, I, I, we can touch on, you have the Benelux, League, which you play, uh, you know, 25-ish games a year, but then you also have uh, individual cups that played within Belgium and Holland. So the cups are almost just as important, if not more important than the Benelux. league. Um, so um, that kind of takes up one third of the season as well, which is um, it's they're cool rivalries. Yeah. So a great experience overall in the Benny Liga. And then you go into like the, you went into like the Belgium cup and like how important it is for lo locals. Like what, what are those games like and just being able to play in those games and, see everything from like the the fan perspective like how important like that is to them yeah uh yeah belgium cup is huge to all the the teams in belgium um obviously the benelux is important too when you go up to holland uh den Haag, heron vane these are they all draw lots of fans for, for their games yeah. and it's very competitive um but within belgium the belgian cup is like the prized you know trophy for all the locals so we had a big rivalry with liege bulldogs and um, i don't a lot of people listening to this probably aren't super familiar with the setup geographically of Belgium, but what you have is you have, um, you know, a region of um, Belgium, you have Flanders, and then obviously you have Wallonia, which is the French region in the Southeast. <clears throat> and that region of Belgium is the French region. And so we, there's a huge rivalry between Liège Bulldogs, which are in the French region and yeah. uh, where I was based in Leuven. And they're only 50 minutes apart, but one area it's, you know, everyone speaks, you know, Dutch, in the other region, it's all French. So our, we played them both of my seasons there in the Belgian Cup semifinal in like a three-game three, three game playoff. And it was just, the rivalry was crazy. It was a very, uh, you know, intense rivalry, like guys, you know, doing everything they can. And uh, my first year there, we, you know, we lost in the semifinal in overtime. In my second year there, we lost and it was a 1-1 tie. And we had to, it was the second game. The only way we could have made a third game is if they pulled me and we scored to make it 2-1. So we pulled me with, I, I got pulled with four seconds left and the other, they scored. And then at the end of our set, just to give you a sense of how competitive and how much the two teams hate each other. Um, the last game I was there or in our semifinal, uh, it was a 2-1 score. So we knew the game was over. And uh, so I'm on the ice and four seconds left. And I'm, I'm looking at the lineup uh, for the draw and I'm like, man, this looks like it's going to be an all out brawl. And I can send you a video when we hop off the phone and maybe you can link it within the YouTube video. But yeah. 
as soon as the draw gets, uh, you know, thrown down, it's a, a full four on four. I think one, two guys, my other important buddy and didn't fight, but it was four guys all going at it, four fights simultaneously at once. And it was just like, you know, it, that just kind of speaks to the rivalry between uh, yeah. Luvin and Liege. And I had a lot of, a number of friends, my, like I mentioned, my friend Shane on that team and Liege. So like when we played against each other, like, you know, if he scored, he'd be like, come and pass me laughing. Or if I made a save, I'd just be like, um, but like the rivalries there were, you know, really enjoyable. And I, I liked that league. I thought we didn't necessarily have the best team, but um, in terms of like uh, how I played there, I, I definitely had two, two strong seasons. I think <clears throat> in terms of like goals against average, obviously there's a lot of goals scored in that league. Um, just like high scoring games, um, just yeah. based on the way the, there's not as much defensive structure. So like a lot of guys like, Hey, caring about offense, but like not necessarily caring about their plus and minus. And um, so my, my first year there, I played in Leuven and then going into my second year, I had three teams within Bena league that reached out and said, Hey, we want to sign you to our team um, to, uh, and then I had a couple teams outside in other countries that wanted to sign me, but it worked out. I really liked the group. I really liked my coach in Leuven. And I said, you know what, I'm only planning to play one more year of a pro I'm going to sign back and go there for a second year, which was cool because as an import, if you go to a new spot, there's so many things you have to worry about logistically. So me knowing going into my last year that I was going to go back to the exact same spot, it was, it's really nice to know that, Hey, you already know the guys, you already know the rink, you're familiar with uh, the surroundings. So it, it was a good setup all around. And um, I, I have a lot of good things to say about um, both the league in uh, Belgium and, you know, the people, teammates and, you know, an amazing coach. So. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And like, you love those rivalry games, like those bring out the best of everyone. And like, you could yeah. just feel the intensity and like the atmosphere in the arena is like the exact same. And yeah. like, it's just, it it's all, it's on, it's an unreal feeling when you're playing those rivalry games. Yeah. And another part to add to that too, is that like, uh, you know, Belgian beer is some of the best beer in the world. Obviously, you know, if you're listening to this, obviously you have to be of age, but yeah. of age in Europe is pretty much like whatever age your parents feel is acceptable. Um, so, but when you're in, uh, you know, rivalries, there, a really cool part about, you could be like having an all out brawl, whether it's like, uh, you know, uh, you're saying it's an actual ball or just like a really intense game, but after games, like, even if you have like a really intense rivalry, um, an hour after the game ends, you know, you're up in the, the restaurant having a drink, you know, with other imports and other teams, because you have that mutual respect for yeah. other imports in the league. Like you're going through the same uh, journeyman experience of living overseas. And um, so it's like, you can trade stories, uh, you can talk on stuff. And obviously Belgian beer is some of the best beer in the world. So like, you know, there's a lot of, you know, stuff that when you win and you have a couple of days off, you can really um, enjoy, enjoy good times and, and have fun with your teammates responsibly. But um, it's a, yeah. that's a fun element of, cause Europe's beautiful. You can, you know, walk, you can walk down cobblestone streets from hundreds of years ago. And then two minutes later, you're at the rink. So there's nothing to complain about. Yeah, that's awesome. But uh, Ryan, I have a few more questions before we wrap things up here. So uh, do you have any uh, tips for goaltenders looking to get to that next level? Yeah, um, I think this is just a, kind of more of a, a broad level one. But obviously, if you're you know trying to get to the next level, everyone's next level is different. Some people, yeah. it could be a youth player that's looking to get up to a higher level in midget. Maybe it's to you know, move up to junior, whether it's, you know, the college route, or maybe it's someone that's listening to this and maybe you're just playing recreationally and you want to take it more seriously and just become a better goalie. <clears throat> Main tip I have is that um, one of my favorite quotes is like, it's obviously a well-known one, um, which is from Aristotle. And I always, you know, I, I know it well. And it's, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, therefore, is not an act, but a habit. And the reason I like that quote is, we are what we repeatedly do. So what that means is if you do something every day and you tell yourself a certain story, eventually the more you do it, and if you're iterating and doing it right, you will embody that stuff. So when it comes to someone, if whatever level you're at in goaltending, whether you're a youth goalie, rec goalie, or you know goalie that's trying to move up the actual hockey trajectory to the higher levels, what, what position are you in now? Where do you want to be? And what are, and what are the things not, don't be fictitious and say, I want to be up here. You have to look and look at a, an actual calendar, look at a map and say, what can I do today? What can I do this week? What can I do these next few months to slowly get myself there? 
just as if you're really out of shape, you can't say, Hey, I want to be, have a six pack and have all this stuff by next week. Yeah. You have to put together an actual plan and then say, okay, what, what areas am I weekend? And you have to actually like candidly look at yourself and say, Hey, maybe I'm bad at footwork. Maybe my glove positioning is bad. So look and say, okay, maybe that's going and working with a goalie coach. Maybe you don't have the finances for a goalie coach, which I certainly didn't have growing up for a lot. Maybe that means you take your cell phone, set it down horizontally facing yourself. You work on crease movement drills and you consistently work on this stuff. And it's not just working on it every day endlessly. You have to work on it and then try to improve on it a little bit every day. Yeah. And those 1% increments make a big difference. So that's that's the biggest thing. And so that that consistency and work ethic, this counts for on ice, this counts for off ice, this counts in your decision making. So especially for young players, as you start going from high school into college and you're not sure what you're going to want to do, pick your spots. You can certainly go out and have fun with your friends. But if you're going to be go out and make poor decisions, that's going to affect your ability to wake up at seven in the morning and train. So what's your actual goal? If your ultimate goal is to move up to the highest levels, you really have to put in a lot of work. And so that, you know, goes to your mental training. I think early on, I think when I made that decision a while back in 28 or 2008 of, hey, I'm going to play pro in Europe when I had no chance or I'm so far away from it. I listened to um, it was called if you Google it now, it's called the goalie's mind. And it was like kind of like, you know, classical music where it was like visualization. And it was a little cheesy at the time. It would be like, you'd be listening to stuff and it would be like soothing classical piano. And it would be yeah. like, I am solid and I am confident. I am a wall. And it would be like things like that. But I remember like listening to it and it was more of the like mental aspect of the game of like doing all those things for a long time. So wherever you are in your hockey career, listening to this, whether you're still playing pro or if you're, you know, much earlier and you want to keep moving up, just be consistent for a long time. And good things will happen. You know, you might not make it to the highest level, but you're certainly going to take away life experiences that help you. So that's, that, that's my best answer. And it's, it's tried and true. So. Yeah. that That's an awesome tip. And like going with that, like have meaning in every, in everything you do, like when you are like looking at your video, like have meaning and like what you want to do to improve on the next one and just keep going after that. Cause like you always got to have some type of meaning if you want to get better. Yep. Yeah. That's, it's really important. And even when you get to a certain level, you can always work on stuff, especially for, you know, for all players, but for goalies, there's always stuff you can work on. Uh, the, the time you get worse is when you, you know, think, Oh, I've, I've got it all. Cause you know, all it takes is one bad game to push you back to a yeah. uh, reality of being like, Hey, you know, and sometimes you train really hard and you know, the bounces don't go your way. And other times you're maybe not having the best game, but you happen to, you know, the bounces do go your way. So um, yeah, no, it's just, it's part of the position and, and goaltending is obviously, uh, one of the most visible ones. Uh, yeah. so that's kind of the, the way it is. Yeah, absolutely. So then like my next question is like, you're, you're listed at five ten on your elite prospects. Yep. So like, it's a shorter, it's shorter for a goalie, like I'm five ten too. So like we're on the short yeah. side of like what, like a lot of goalies are like, like six, one, six, two, six, three. So yeah. like, what are some of the important things to like have yourself not get overlooked for your height? Yeah. Well, first off, I think any goalie that says they're 5'10 is probably around like five, nine and a half and maybe, you know, almost there, but like you're, you're not, you could be five, nine, five, nine and a half. Like you always, I mean, even guys that are six, two uh, at an inch, there are guys that are five eleven at an inch to be six foot. Um, but it's one of those things you, you do as a little younger, but obviously as a 5'10 goalie, the main things that, and you've had a number of goalies on this podcast, both big and small, yeah. Um, have seen great success goalies that are 510 some goalies that are way bigger um, I remember goalie coach when I was younger who I used to help coach with in the summer sometime um, Bob Janos he would always like joke around like he was a shorter goalie um, you know similar um, you know size to us and he you know had a really you know, had a solid career through college and you know played a little bit in the, had a good season in the coast before having a really good coaching career um, but he obviously, you know, goalies in that position have to, you know, you have to, you have to kind of, as a smaller goalie, you have to work to prove that you're good enough. Yeah. Whereas if you're a big goal, you kind of have to like prove that you're not bad, but he used to always have a couple of jokes. He said like, obviously like, Hey, big goalie, you might've big holes, but also based on the way the NHL is these days, they're generally looking for bigger goalies. Yeah. One thing I think for goalies that are more around like our height, you know, five, nine, five, 10, even up to like six foot is you have to bring other tangible uh, skills to the table. So like the best example for would be like, say like a UC Saros, who's like maybe a little bit taller, but he's about 5'10", 5'11". 
you have to, as a, as a smaller goalie, you have to be really dialed on your positioning. You have to also be dialed on your save selection. So that means that, you know, making sure you're not just getting, you know, super wide in your stance and then just reacting to be like dropping, yeah. have to know save selection, when to stay up, when to stay down. You obviously can't use, uh, you know, RVHs in the same, you know, lazy manner. You have to be more um, specific about it. Uh, one thing that, and also the European game, obviously with the bigger ice, um, you have to have more patience. And I'm sure a number of other goalies you've had on the podcast that have played over in Europe have touched on some specifics. But in Europe, depending on where you're playing, a lot of times in Europe, there's a lot more lateral movement. And a lot of times there's one yeah. more pass before shots are taken. So if you watch any game in the NHL or even the AHL, it's such a busy ice that there's so many guys in front, a lot of bodies, a lot of stuff in tight in Europe. It's spread out a little more stuff's brought in zone. If guys in Europe are pulling, breaking out of the zone and they don't see the right look there, a lot of times they're happy to do a loop and loop right back out and come out and on, uh, you know, plays within your own defensive end. A lot of times you, you want to be smart and staying on your feet because a lot of times when you think that, you know, a block might take place or someone might take a shot, sometimes they're looking for that extra pass. So you just have to be a little bit more uh, patient. And as a small goalie, you just have to, Hey, make up, you know, don't use it as an excuse, make, use it as a, a way to say, Hey, you know, Hey, Hey, it might not be the tallest goalie, but I have good lateral movement, good position. You know, what's the, what's the only thing that matters for goalies? Can you stop the puck? So stop like, puck. yeah. So obviously like size does have its advantages when you keep moving to the top, top tiers, but um, for smaller goalies, it's, it's no excuse after when, when you're about our, our size, it's like you, you still can cover net really well. You yeah. just have to play well positionally. So that's the biggest advice I have for goalies around our size is don't use it as an excuse, but you better be, uh, you know, darn well at footwork and you better be able to, to move well to compensate. So. Yeah, absolutely. Those are, those are some great tips because you need to be on, on angle, like precise movement, explosive, like, especially when you're shorter and yep. like taller goalies, like you can go down and like, it'll just hit you. Whereas yeah, you like can, sometimes if you're a shorter goal, like it'll just go right above your shoulder and go in the net. Yeah. And the problem too, I mean, a lot of times, uh, you know, bigger goalies, you, you can't, it's, it's not so black and white in that there's a lot of goal, bigger goalies that also have yeah. great movement uh, and great positioning all tied yeah. together. Like, you know, whether you're looking at Vasilevsky or any other goalies. So it's like, it's tying the two together. But as you see, if you watch a UC Saros, you watch a bigger goalie in the league, you can get it done. You can even look at like, a, you know, Jonas Enroth who played in Buffalo for a while. He's, he's a little bit taller, but he's still on NHL spectrum, much smaller goalie. And he's just, uh, I skated with him a little bit during the lockout and he was, uh, it was unreal positioning. Like you watched him in net and then like, I think he was like an inch taller than me. And you're like, man, he's dialed in terms of like his yeah. form and you just pick up different things. You're like, Hey, like positioning is well, you also have a big, you get a big chest protector helps, but yeah, that's the, that's the main stuff. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I like to end every podcast with this question. Like, what's your favorite pump up song? Like you're trying to get a lift in, like listening, listening to this when you're going, going to the grind for, for work. Like, what are you listening to? I don't know. I like, it's, it's hard to give you like giving you like, uh, you know, one song particularly might be really hard. So what I'll give you is just more of like a genre that like, I still like to this day. So playing over in Europe for a number of, of seasons, Honestly, you get very used to like in the locker room, listen to a, a mix of like European music is always a little bit ahead of North America in terms of like, whether it's EDM or like club music or like a mix of like remixes with like, you know, yeah. whether we're talking like Avicii or like Rihanna or whatever it is, they're always a little bit ahead. So I think like just a genre I like in general, even whether it's working out or just like getting that, you know, if I hear, if I hear certain songs that are like, you know, a nice EDM or like a club type song, even though after a while, it's like, I might not listen to that day to day. I might listen to more rock yeah. or other indie alternative rock, but like listening to any songs like that um, over from like European, like, you know, festivals and stuff, you know, you could, I, that just gets me back in the mood for, you know, being in the locker room and, you know, being around the boys and stuff like that. So my, my answer to that is any Euro club type music just, you know, gives me that hockey feeling of being in the locker room, whether it's after like a big win or something or going out with the guys after. And uh, obviously that's the beauty of playing hockey. You get yeah. um, the com camaraderie um, in a locker room. You get a, you have a lot of strong personalities in locker rooms, but um, it's, it's something to cherish because any player that plays, whether you play 
stop a junior college pro um, as you play you're gonna there's obviously gonna be memories where you look back and you're like i didn't like certain aspects yeah. but in the long run you're you're gonna you know you're gonna cherish a lot of those cool memories with the boys so yeah that that's unreal that's awesome but uh ryan thank you so much for coming on the show i really appreciate your time and i look forward to following your work the rest of the way yeah thanks jack i appreciate it and i uh, look forward to keeping in touch and uh we'll chat soon thanks ciao yeah absolutely